Welcome back. We've been considering the arguments advanced by Avicenna and Descartes for the conclusion that although I can doubt everything else in the world, notably the existence and properties of my body, I can't doubt that I myself exist, and therefore I can conclude with certainty that I do exist. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now, we should note that the so-called cogito or thinking argument is not unassailable, and indeed, it's been challenged by many people. Why believe that the existence of thoughts implies the existence of a thinker? Maybe thoughts are free-floating things that exist all on their own. But if there must be a thinker, why believe that I'm the thinker? Maybe the thoughts belong to someone else. For example, maybe my thoughts are actually thoughts in the mind of God. Or maybe there are ones and zeros in the super duper computer that's running this simulation that we call the universe. But for the sake of argument, let's suppose that Descartes has given us a sound argument that we can know our own existence. The immediate question that arises for us, as it did for Descartes and Avicenna, is what am I? What is this thing of whose existence I'm certain? In the passage from the Discourse on Method that we started before, Descartes goes on to answer this question. He says, I knew from this that I was a substance whose whole essence or nature was only to think, and that I had no need for any place to exist and did not depend on any material thing. So that this I, which is to say my mind, through which I am what I am, is entirely distinct from my body, and even that it's easier to know than my body, and further, that even if my body did not exist at all, my mind would not cease to be all that it is. So here we get Descartes' big idea. There are two kinds of things in the universe. The second kind of stuff is that which bodies are made of, and that's matter. We can doubt that there is any matter, but that doesn't stop us from thinking about matter and understanding that the essential feature of matter if it exists at all, is that it takes up space. Matter is smeared across space. Matter is the extended stuff, res extensa. So like Aristotle, Descartes denies that there's such a thing as empty space, that is a vacuum, because if there's space, then it's occupied by matter, because matter is, by definition, that which takes up space. The other kind of stuff, the one that's first known to us because its existence can't be doubted, is the thinking stuff, res cogitans. What am I? I'm a thinking thing, a substance whose whole existence or nature was only to think. The thinking stuff, that is, me, myself, the mind or soul, does not take up space. Descartes says in the passage we just read that the mind or soul has no need for any place to exist. They're not located in space and don't require space for their existence, therefore they don't require matter. Minds are not matter and do not require matter. They're thinking things. So there are two kinds of stuff, hence Descartes' dualism after the Latin root for two. There's the thinking stuff, res cogitans, whose essence it is to think and that doesn't take up space. And there's the bodily material stuff, res extensa, whose essence is to take up space and therefore is incompatible with being a thinking thing that has no location or extension. Now we can connect Descartes' view of minds with our earlier discussion of physics. Descartes thinks that almost everything humans or people can do can be explained, at least in principle, by mechanical physics. So he has no reason to postulate the existence of earth, air, fire, water, and ether as distinct elements. There's just one kind of substance that takes up space, and that's the res extensa, or matter. And there's no reason to postulate vegetative or animal souls to explain growth and decay or sensation and movement. These are all things that automata and animals can do, and Descartes thinks that animals are basically just naturally occurring automata. These things operate entirely by mechanical principles, so we don't need to postulate that they have souls. Only human beings have souls, and souls only do one thing, they think. Souls are not needed for growth, sensation, movement, Souls are only needed for rational, intellectual thought, like doing philosophy. Now, Descartes is pretty smart. He's a scientist and a mathematician, as well as a philosopher. He was an accomplished physicist, 
having written probably the best account of optics of his time, and he's the inventor of algebraic geometry and what we now call the Cartesian coordinate system, the method of graphing functions on the x and y axis as in graph paper. He also had some biological knowledge, not to mention experience in warfare. So Descartes knows that bodies and brains are important, and he has an explanation of how all this works. First, bodies are complex mechanical devices that work on hydraulic or pneumatic principles. William Harvey published his account of the circulation of the blood in 1628, and Descartes knew about that. The nerves on this view are thought of as tubes that carry movements such as vibrations from one part of the body to another. So when a body part is stimulated, these vibrations are transmitted to the brain, where they are in turn transmitted to the mind. And then the process is reversed as the rational mind produces vibrations in the brain and hence the nerves that result in the activation of the muscles and so forth. Second, as to how the body and mind interact, Descartes postulates that it's at the pineal gland that the connection is made. The pineal gland is one of the only gross anatomical features of the brain that's not lateralized, that is, divided into left and right lobes. So Descartes thought that its symmetric location and shape gave good reasons to think that it was the central organ within the brain where all the bodily motions literally come together to communicate with the mind. The brain is like a fancy radio transmitter and receiver for the body to communicate with the mind. Of course, we've barely scratched the surface of Descartes' views and his arguments for them, but we've got the big picture conclusion about the nature of minds and bodies for which he's famous. Dualism is the view that there are two basic kinds of stuff in the world, mind and body. The bodily or material stuff is located in space, but the mind is not. The mind thinks, but the body does not. And they're able to communicate with each other and therefore interact. So Descartes' theory is also known as interactionist dualism. Some of you will think that two kinds of stuff is at least one too many. But remember, Descartes just trimmed nature down from at least six kinds of stuff to just two kinds. So by comparison, he can claim that his theory is much simpler and more economical. In the next lesson, we're going to consider an important challenge to Descartes' dualism that was made especially perilous for him by Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. That will lead us to consider some alternative versions of dualism and then set us on a path to consider non-dualistic theories about the nature of minds. To get ready for that lesson, please read Jennifer McWheeney's article, Princess Elizabeth and the Mind-Body Problem.